This is the Discovery Files podcast from the U.S. National Science Foundation. After the press conference announcing the U.S. National Science Foundation's Nanograv Physics Frontier Center's milestone detection of low-frequency gravitational waves, we were able to sit down with American theoretical physicist Kip Thorne. Known for his contributions in gravitational physics and astrophysics, he famously won wagers with lifelong friend Stephen Hawking, consulted with Carl Sagan on his novel Contact, which later became a film starring Jodie Foster, and his work with wormholes led to his involvement with the 2017 film Interstellar. Thornton was awarded the Nobel Prize in 2017 in physics, along with Rainer Weiss and Barry C. Barish, for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. Dr. Thorne, astronomy really seems to capture people's imagination. Why is seeing the sky in different ways important? Humans have looked up at the sky and wondered at the stars ever since the ancestors that ultimately gave rise to the human race were here. The stars, the skies just excite humans intrinsically. Children grow up fascinated by the stars. But all that we see in the stars with our eyes is light. That's electromagnetic waves oscillating electric and magnetic fields that oscillate just at a certain frequency reach into oscillation. And there's ever so much more information about the stars and about the things out in space that comes from other wavelength bands of electromagnetic waves. And so we now have this astronomy done with light, with x-rays, with radio waves, with gamma rays, ultraviolet light, and many different bands of the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, this astronomy has all been created with these other frequency bands in my lifetime. But the laws of physics say that there are actually two kinds of waves that can be created in the distant universe and travel to Earth bringing us information about what's out there. The electromagnetic waves, which is what we've always used up until now, and gravitational waves. They're the only other kind of wave that we have for exploring the universe. And the gravitational waves, as we understand them, are going to bring us very different kinds of information about the universe that uh, you could never see with electromagnetic waves. For example, gravitational waves created at the very birth of the universe should be travel unscathed through all of the hot matter of the early universe as the universe is very hot and expanding. They don't scatter, they don't get absorbed, they bring the information from the birth of the universe to us today. But electromagnetic waves, they don't come from there. They, they got absorbed, they scattered, they lost their information. Electromagnetic waves, you can't see the beginning of the universe. When black holes collide, they produce gravitational waves. They produce no electromagnetic waves at all. So if you want to see colliding black holes, you can only see it with gravitational waves. If you want to see the birth of the universe, you can only see it with gravitational waves. It's a whole new way to explore the universe and to explore things that you can't see in any other manner. Can you explain the difference between the ways LIGO detected gravitational waves and the way Nanograv has? The LIGO project was a project that grew out of ideas of Ray Weiss at MIT in 1972. LIGO then after nearly 50 years of development of technology and building large instruments, we saw our first gravitational waves on September 14 of 2015 and announced it in 2016. That was a big deal. Those gravitational waves are waves that have periods of oscillation of about a hundredth of a second. These nanograv gravitational waves, they use a technique conceived by a Russian named Mikhail Sajin and an American named Stephen Detweiler in 1977 and 78. That's also about 50 years ago. So in both cases, it's ha taken 50 years for the payoff to come. <laughs> but uh, in both cases, we now have observed gravitational waves, the very rapidly oscillating waves that LIGO sees. And Nanograv has now seen in a very convincing way this random stochastic background of gravitational waves that's just filling the universe. Like the LIGO discovery, it's just tremendously exciting. So what is the importance to astrophysics of confirming the existence of gravitational waves? I think confirming the existence of gravitational waves is actually important less for astrophysics. Well, let me back up. Confirming the existence of gravitational waves is very important for fundamental physics. Einstein's laws of general relativity demand gravitational waves should exist. If they didn't exist, then something is really badly wrong with our understanding of the fundamental laws of physics. And so confirming existence tells us that general relativity is really on the right track. And uh, 
the detailed experiments, observations that have been done by LIGO primarily uh, up until now show that that's true to very high precision. Confirming existence of gravitational waves for astrophysics is simply the payoff in terms of observational astronomy over the coming decades and centuries. Think back to the time of Galileo, that's 400 years ago roughly. He pointed his optical telescope at uh, Jupiter, discovered Jupiter's four large moons, and created and began instrument-based electromagnetic astronomy. And look at where we are now. What a radical revolution in our understanding of the universe has come from those instruments with electromagnetic waves since the time of Galileo. Gravitational waves, now confirmed to exist, are the foundation by themselves and in collaboration with electromagnetic waves through what we call multi messenger astronomy. They're the foundation for the future of astronomy. And several centuries from now, when our descendants look back on this era, I think they're going to say that one of the great contributions that uh, we gave to them is our understanding of the universe through gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves working together. Having been involved with the founding of LIGO in 1984, have the results outperformed your expectations? And my expectations for LIGO were very high. And I wouldn't say that the results have outperformed them. They have, in fact, been about what I expected. It is quite remarkable that already in the early 1980s, it seemed clear to me that the first thing we would see would be colliding black holes. And uh, it seemed also clear to me that we really needed to have a capability to simulate colliding black holes in order to understand the signals well enough in order to be able to analyze the data. And so I think perhaps my biggest contribution was making sure that that, that happened. And here we are. We're now seeing with uh, the current data run, a pair of black holes collide approximately once every other day. And it's just fantastic. It's wonderful. And the science is coming off in terms of beginning to understand where these black hole binaries came from, beginning to test general relativity with ultra high precision. These are what I was expecting to happen. So for the younger generation, they were euphoric when gravitational waves were discovered. And I think they're euphoric over the science that's coming out. I just have a sense of profound satisfaction that the, the vision that I was having in the 1970s and 80s came true. And uh, I just sit back and just feel a great warmth. That's <laughs> all great warmth. It is really happening more or less the way I expected. You mentioned testing general relativity, and you had the foresight to imagine things that we're only just detecting now decades ago. So I'm wondering, what sort of exciting things do you think will be confirmed over the next decade or two? Well, I think that one of the most important things to me is testing general relativity in the regime where space-time is highly disturbed, oscillating rapidly with large amplitudes. That's the regime of the black hole collisions, which in essence create a storm in the fabric or the shape of space and the rate of flow of time. Seeing that pinned down, that the gravitational waves are just what you would expect from that space-time storm is the most exciting thing to me. Now, to my disappointment, this is what it, my one disappointment, is that most of the waves from the most violent part of the storm go down the black hole and don't come out to us. And so what I'm hoping for is that we see more details. We get to higher precision, and also we see final black holes with larger spins when we get enough data that we do begin to see more of the gravitational waves coming from the violent part of the space-time storm than what we've been seeing. It's not every day that we get to talk with a Nobel laureate. Can you tell us a bit about your experience getting that phone call? I remember this very vividly, perhaps not surprising. I had got the call at 2 a.m. in the morning in California. The voice on the other end said, I'm calling from the Nobel Foundation. It will not surprise you, he said, that the Nobel Prize is being awarded jointly to you, to Rainer Weiss, and to Barry Barish for your contributions to LIGO's detection of gravitational waves. And I responded immediately, I'm not surprised, but I'm very disappointed. Really? Why? Because the prize should have gone to the entire team. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't make this happen. The team made it happen. And I thought that by now that the Nobel Committee would have figured out how to deal with something like this. You didn't give it to the entire team for the discovery of the Higgs boson, and you're not giving it for the discovery of gravitational waves. 
and you really need to start giving it to teams in cases like this, you have an obligation to educate the general public about the importance of teamwork and the importance of large teams on certain pieces of science that simply couldn't be done in any other way. And so we had a bit of an argument over this, and he responded, well, we'll discuss this when you get to Stockholm. And so when I got to Stockholm, we did have discussion in which he explained that they do have the power to change the thing so that they can give it to teams, but they've not been able to convince themselves that they should do this. And so we have our disagreements. So that's sort of the backstory of it. But certainly being in Stockholm and receiving the prize was a very moving experience. It's just a, a, an unbelievably moving experience. But perhaps to me, the most important thing was that we were able to bring a significant fraction of the LIGO team to Stockholm and uh, share this with them. How key has NSF funding been to your career? The U.S. National Science Foundation was essential to my career. There was no way that I could have done the science that I did without the National Science Foundation. The key to my own career and to the success I've had has been the students, the graduate students, postdoctoral students that I trained and who worked with me and with each other uh, over the decades. I had 50 some odd PhD students and about 75 postdoctoral students during my career. Uh, they were funded by the National Science Foundation primarily. And for me, the research that they did while they were my students was ever so much more important than anything that I myself personally did. My ideas, uh, the directions that I thought were important, got tremendously amplified by these students. And they then began their careers through that process of working with me. But they, as I say, were primarily funded by the National Science Foundation. And NSF funding really made it all possible, just as they have made nanograph possible, they've made LIGO possible. Now, while we had you, I wanted to touch on something that's figured in a fair amount of sci-fi entertainment over the last 30 years or so, and is something you've theorized and written about. Can you explain how a wormhole might be used for time travel? <laughs> so let me begin by saying that uh, we have fairly strong evidence, but no proof by any means, that the laws of physics prevent backward time travel from happening on the scale, at least, of humans. I think it's fairly likely that it happens on subatomic scales, and I won't go into the details, but I think that's tied to the so-called information loss paradox. That's getting off in some other direction. But uh, we haven't been able to prove that that's the case, and so I can describe how time travel could be possible. It, let me just describe the way that was first introduced, I think, in a paper I wrote with students in the 1980s. You have a, a wormhole. It has two mouths. One mouth stays here in this room. I give the other mouth to my wife, and she has very advanced technology, and so she rides this very rapid spacecraft out for about, say, a year out at nearly the speed of light and then comes back. And so two years have elapsed as seen by her, but as seen by me, 50 years have elapsed. So I am really old <laughs> by the time I come back. But if we hold hands through the wormhole, she looks at my watch, I look at hers, they have to tick at the same rate. That seems pretty obvious, and it is the case. So as seen through the wormhole, both mouths have aged by two years. But as seen through the external universe, my mouth has aged by 50 years. So if you then puzzle that out in your mind, you can figure out the with her back now, her wormhole there and my wormhole here, all I have to do is go into her wormhole mouth and I'll go back in time by 50 years when I go through the wormhole. But you have to think about it for a while to convince yourself that that's the case. Let me just say that this is all explained ever so much better in terms of poetry, verse, in a book of paintings and poetry that I have in press that will be published on Halloween this year. It's called The Warped Side of the Universe. The paintings are by Leah Halloran, a superb young painter. This is my attempts at verse. And if you really want to see this described really nicely, go read my book when it comes out. Uh, if, if you like poetry, if you enjoy paintings, this is, I think, a, the best description of this that, that I have seen. Of course, I'm prejudiced. <laughs> well, we'll be looking forward to that one. Finally, at the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned children growing up being fascinated by the stars. What advice would you give to a young person who may be considering pursuing that interest in science? 
So I think the most important piece of advice I would give was the what piece of advice that my grandfather gave to me when I was age four. And I can remember this very vividly. This is my grandpa Kobish. He said to me, Kip, when you grow up, if you get a job that is like play, you will have been a big success. And uh, I took this to heart and did come to realize how very important this was in science and technology when you're trying to do something very difficult, as I chose to do. You have to really love it if you're going to work hard enough to really make it happen. It has to be like play. Otherwise, you are going to have a devil of a time putting your heart and soul into it in the way that is going to be necessary. As strange it may seem, but I think that's the most important message I would give to a young kid growing up who wants to do science or technology. Special thanks to Kip Thorne. For The Discovery Files, I'm Nate Potker. Please subscribe wherever you get podcasts, and if you like our program, share with a friend and consider leaving a review. Discover how the U.S. National Science Foundation is advancing research at nsf.gov.